all very much welcome. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, first of all, uh, some of our viewers, they know you as Kay Wilson, mm -hmm. but I call you Tal Hartouf. Yes. Can you tell me mm. why this is, uh, why this difference is there? Okay, so uh, it's a long story. Mm -hmm. And what happened was about four years after the attack, uh, I just found myself like I usually do. It's a bit like Forrest Gump. I didn't plan anything, but I found myself speaking about what happened mm -hmm. and the funding to the Palestinian Authority. I was speaking about that all around the world. Uh, I wrote a book uh, under the name K, And as the time was going on, uh, it's like a metamorphosis happens inside you. And I realized that I was only known for being stabbed. Mm. Okay. And that's not a very rewarding CV. Mm. So I, I wanted to create, I wanted to get out of that zeitgeist mm -hmm. uh, and create a new space where I could slowly go back to doing the things I once enjoyed and try new things. Mm -hmm. um, because also, just to, uh, 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 what happened to me was very, very well known in Israel and actually throughout the world because Christine was a Christian. Mm. Um, but I didn't, that was, you're a media person, okay? Mm. I'm, I didn't enjoy or seek or want the publicity. No, but Kay Wilson was very known. Yeah, very known, like, mm. and very famous for good and for bad. Uh, and I didn't, I just found it intrusive. Mm. And I, I had a meaning and an omission to talk about things, but I, I wanted back some privacy. Mm -hmm. And I, but it, more than that, I didn't want to keep speaking about the attack for the rest of my life. Right. So I changed my name and I took a name which had the same syllables as Kay Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, changing your name is a very biblical thing to do. It's very popular in Jewish culture today. Like God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the, a short name, similar, sim, uh, how do you say, syllables. And I chose, I wanted an Israeli modern name, but also a biblical name. So Tal would be the dew of mm -hmm. the morning as a reminder to me personally that it's the little unseen things in life which are nourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, acts of kindness, you know, a phone call, a hug, somebody bringing you something that you can't be bothered to go and get for yourself. So it's every time somebody call me Tal, then I'm reminded of the kindness of others. Mm. And uh, your last name? Huh? And how to. Um, and if we're talking about kindness, then I have been the recipient of goodness. Mm. As much as I've been the recipient of barbaric evil, I've experienced kindness and goodness from Jewish people, Christians, Muslims, and I just thought, because also in our tradition, sometimes we invoke the name of a person by taking that name on. But then I realized if I was to name everybody who's been good to me, mm -hmm. I'd never stop saying my name. You know, we go it would on be a forever. very long way. So I chose Hal Tov. It's, it's one word in Hebrew, but literally means the mountain of goodness. Mm -hmm. So every time I say my new name, it's instinctive, but it, it reminds me of the good rather than the bad. במקביל לחקירה הזאת, אנחנו מקבלים הודעה על אירוע נוסף של דקירה של אישה שנמלטה מהתוקפים שלה. המקרה של קיי תופס אותי במשמרת במד"א בגוש עציון, אנחנו מקבלים קריאה על מישהי שנמצאה דקורה, עלתה מאיזה ואדי, יחפה, לא ברור מה קורה שם. אנחנו מגיעים, רואים גברת פצועה עם הרבה דקירות בגוף. מתחילים טיפול, מציל חיים, ותוך כדי זה היא אומרת לנו שיש עוד, uh, עוד חברה שלה שנמצאת בוואדי והיא לא יודעת מה קורה איתה, ואנחנו מזיקים עוד כוחות. באינטואיציה שלנו אנחנו תמיד חושבים uh, מה יכול להיות קשור למה, בטח באירוע הזה שהסמיכות היא יחסית קרובה, שאתה השטח הוא יחסית קרוב, uh, וקו אווירי המרחק הוא לא גדול מדי. אני מגיעה לבית החולים, קיי נמצאת במצב מאוד מאוד לא טוב. הייתה חבושה כולה, בקושי דיברה, הייתה חלשה מאוד. 
אנחנו יושבות, והיא מתחילה לספר לי את הסיפור הכל כך קשה ו- וטראומטי. בהתחלה באופן מאוד מאוד כללי, מה קרה, ואחר כך אנחנו יורדות לפרטים. עד היום שאני נזכרת במה שקיי עברה, ואני ככה מנסה להיכנס לתחושות שלה ומה עבר עליה באותו רגע, זה לא נתפס בעיניי. It's a beautiful autumn day, December 2010. And we get to the Tzomit Drachim, and I say to her, let's just go and see the viewpoint. We climb up, we're sitting on a, a rock. I'm eating garanim, I'm showing her how to spit them out, and this is how Israelis do it, we're giggling. And then suddenly, 60 feet down the hill, אני רואה שני אנשים מתכופפים בספח, you know? I mean, I've been here 32 years. I have Arab friends, I have Palestinian friends. I can see by the way they dress. They're Palestinians. So my heart, uh, it's thumping, you know? I'm nervous. So I signal Christine not to make a noise, because I, I didn't want them to see us. But one stands up, and he says, יש לכם מים? ככה בעברית. באותו רגע קיי מבינה שמשהו משהו לא טוב עלול לקרות. It's like a log, you know, a tree gets in my back, and I go to the fall to the ground, my nose splits open, and someone's rubbing my head in the dirt. I'm going to go to the hospital, and I'm going to go to the hospital. כל זה היא מספרת לי בבית החולים בקושי רב, שהיא באמת פצועה אנוש, ואני בכלל לא בטוחה. שהיא הולכת לסיים את זה. זאת אומרת, אני לא בטוחה שאני מצליחה לגבות ממנה את כל הפרטים האלה ושהיא תשרוד בכלל עד הסוף. I can smell the pines, I can hear the birds, and uh, we're being held at knife point. In the first few minutes, you know, it's like I've been banged on the head. You know, I can't think. All I can think of, li ze lo kore, li ze lo kore. It doesn't happen to me. This is, this is a dream. And then he sees my Magen David, and he just took it off very gently. You know, it wasn't... And he, he smiles, and he says, Shu Hadir, like, what's this? So I answered in, uh, in Hebrew, I said, Magen David. And then uh, I see this light out of the corner of my eye. And it's not God, and it's not my life flashing before me. You know, it's the sun on his machete. And I realize he's going to behead me. And just as I think of that, and everything I remember about the Pigo is very musical, the sounds I remember even more than the sights. It's like some cosmic symphonia, you know? They scream, Allah Akbar. I hear Christine say, Jesus, help me. And uh, he stabs me in the back so hard, I fall to the ground. 
I don't know, I just realized then somehow that the only, that people die with their eyes open and I must play dead. So I made a moral choice and I tried not to move and I kept my eyes open and I watched like two meters away, no more, no more than two meters. Christine was on her back and he's like hacking her up. Kay and Christine are still alive again and again and again. There's no way to Kay who can be able to lose her to Christine, if you understand it. So after 12 beatings, they, uh, they leave. I'm still on my side. And then the ground is vibratio, you know, and I realize they're coming back. And one rolls me over now on my back. So I'm looking up at the pine trees and the sun is low and it's pink and it's orange and it's purple. It's the most beautiful sunset. And then suddenly this, hand, this silhouette of a hand and a knife, it covers the sun. And behind that silhouette, I see these black eyes and I watch him, I watch him stab me in the chest and I don't blink, flinch, move. היא מקבלת את ההחלטה לא להוציא הגה, כלום. שקט, דממה. nearer where I parked the car so the police can find my body. I managed to stand and I turned my back on Christine, what's left of her, and just step by step I begin to walk. And it's uh, extremely hard, you know. She was able to walk around the place when she was 13 times in all the parts of her. She was without a line, she was half a line. She was half a line. My lungs are filling with blood. It's like breathing through a straw, you know? No, not enough air. And I see my dog beside me, you know, she's bleeding and... Yeah, yeah, it was just everything was closing down. Started to think of a boodle somewhere over the rainbow and I'm thinking of these chords. And everything is collapsing. I'm, f I'm, I'm feeling so cold, like cold, I never, th even the colors around are going strange, you know? Then it's not autumn color, it's going gray and blue and white. It's, it's like I'm in a fridge, the cold. ואז ככה היא שומעת אה, משפחה שברקע, היא שומעת ילדים, והיא עוד תוך כדי זה, עם כל מה שהיא עברה, היא חושבת רק שלא יראו אותה הילדים. So Tal, we just watched the movie, the Black Forest movie, and we saw that you went back to the place of the attack. which must be really uh, intense also for you. How was that? It, it was intense to go back, but uh, I say this tongue in cheek, it was easier than the first time round. Um, I, it was very important to me when the Israeli TV called mm -hmm. and said they wanted to do a documentary about DNA, and this was classic DNA crime. Mm -hmm. It was very important to me that uh, 
I was the one there mm -hmm. telling them exactly uh, how it happened. You mean not an actor, but you? Yeah, also, I, you know, the last thing you want is like some kind of sensational Hollywood mm -hmm. trash, right? So, and I think the documentary is very nuanced and they managed to really, it was, you'd find this interesting as a presenter, but it was even filmed at the same time of day that the attack took oh, place really? and in the exact vicinity. So the light was the same? The light was the same, the yeah, same. really. Uh, and I don't know what it did for me. It f did a couple of things. Uh, and I don't use the word healing because that's mm -hmm. just too massive. But there was something about being there, like the, the terrorists in the movie were the, the policemen, right? Mm -hmm. There was something uh, calming about being with the police and they have their guns, you know, they probably didn't need to bring them, but, uh, but it was very important for me. Uh, that's also why I spoke English a lot in the, the movie, because mm -hmm. I wanted to take that movie later and, and show it all over the world to help mm -hmm. motivate people to stop the funding of Palestinian terrorists. Right. So on the one hand, it was marginally helpful mm -hmm. from a psychological point of view. Uh, physically, it was hard. It was a very, very cold day. And one of the things that is, what do you call, fallout from the attack. When, when I was walking back through the forest, I was so freezing, like it says. Uh, and it was a very cold day. And as you know, in camera work, you have to shoot and reshoot and reshoot. So physically, it was tough. Yeah. And also reenacting, you know, being tied up and stuff like that. Uh, but it was important. It brings back uh, memories, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, but I kind of disassociated. Mm. That's how I've coped a lot with it. Right. So I, I didn't like go, oh, being attacked or anything like mm. that. But what, it was more like, wow, this stuff really did happen. Mm. You, you uh, went to, through this really unimaginable experience 12 years ago. Um, how would you describe the synt symptoms that you have of trauma? Because the topic today is about how to deal with yeah. trauma. Uh, how would you describe the symptoms? Uh, how long is your program? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I do want to say that it, you don't have to be stabbed to have symptoms of trauma. Okay, yeah. lots of people have a lot of trauma. And I think if I can detail some of it, people might find it helpful for them. Like, oh yeah, I, I was traumatized as a kid or mm -hmm. an adult. For me, it was such a high level of trauma. And the first, the immediate first, uh, what do you call it, symptom, mm -hmm. is uh, disassociation. What Meaning I was very cognizant of what happened. I knew it what happened right from, I never passed out, right from getting to the hospital and the police interviewing me. I had a very good memory and I gave all the details. So I knew, I knew, and I was in pain, obviously, I was busy dying in the hospital. Mm. So I knew what happened. But emotionally, you cannot make that connect. It's too big, right? Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? It means I wasn't able to cry. You know, I could talk, I could, uh, talk about the attack like I'm talking about a recipe if I cooked mm -hmm. or a bus timetable. Uh, so there is a disassociation, and to some extent that's still with me. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I've been with you all over Holland, you know, and we show the documentary, and I, I, I sit there, I think this is actually me. This mm -hmm. is, it's still very hard to believe in a lot of ways. And then, of course, there's the, I, for me, it was sensitivity to noise, any kind of noise, like mm. sudden noise, constant noise. And then you become very isolated, not you. I mean, I'll talk about me. That was a deference. Yeah. I become isolated. Just to um, have the quiet around you. You want quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel that no one understands. Um, so you become kind of socially reclusive, mm -hmm. um, which was, I didn't recognize myself. And I, th I think one of the most difficult things was sleep. I didn't have night or day. And I, I went to the best trauma unit in Israel and the doctors said something very smart. They said, listen, who says that when it's dark you have to sleep and when it's light you need to be awake? Try and see time as 
more global. Mm -hmm. And then when you're tired, even if it's in 11 o'clock in the morning, just lay down for an hour. So that's what I do until today. And really? you, yeah. you don't give yourself this very high bar of regimented, this is night, this is day. Just, I feel tired now, okay, I'm gonna get yeah, a nap. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm just, I'm sorry. And so mm -hmm. it does seem rude to some people. You can mm -hmm. be in the middle of a conversation, which reminds me, I'm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, this is how I cope. But, yeah. uh, and then I do want to say one more thing about trauma. It wasn't just the attack. It was the, the media, right? There was a blackout for six weeks. And I'm, I'm laying in hospital and I know there's speculation. And then there's the trauma of actually being in court mm -hmm. with the murderers. And Israeli courtrooms are tiny. They're much smaller than your studio. Mm -hmm. so and you were very close to the Yeah, murderers. I was like five meters away. And then there's the extended trauma of uh, meeting the parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know Christine that well at all. And then I meet her parents for the trial. and. Then there's the trauma of restructuring life. Like, what can I do now? I'll never be a tour guide again. Mm. And it's like, I'm in pain. And so it's, a, it's been a constant battle, mm. which I feel now that I'm beginning to win. Right. And because about coping with trauma, you mentioned it just uh, before. Uh, how did you find in all these 12 years a way of coping with the trauma that you have? It's taken me 12 years to cope. Uh, and I think the most helpful thing for me, it's, it's like when you're, like as concerning functioning, being a functioning person, I always was very high energy, but I'd have these bursts of high mental energy and then suddenly you're just drained. Mm -hmm. I can't even speak the words out, right? You shut down. So it would happen and like for two, three days at a time, I could hardly listen to myself breathe. Mm. It, like the smallest job, right? Go and get some milk from the little the shop. Grocery, yeah. Not doing it. So what happens is the thing that I found helpful, and I think other people will find helpful, is that I learn to tell myself, okay, okay, today I know I'm having a bad day. It doesn't mean to say I'm gonna have a bad day tomorrow or in a week. I got to the point where I knew that these really intense bad days, they would pass. Mm -hmm. And that liberated me from these expectations of myself. Mm. And uh, I think that's, that was really helpful. You were allowing your, yourself to yeah. feel bad? I just thought, okay, I'm having a bad day. Yeah. Well, that's it, that's it. But I, with that, I knew that it would at some point pass. Mm. So it was the recognition of that, yeah. which was, wow, it was really, it sounds probably very small, but for me, that was a huge, change of mentality. Mm. How in Jewish uh, thinking, what kind of uh, wisdom did you find in there that helped you, you know, on the way forward? Okay, I'll give you, can I give you a small Hebrew lesson? All right, so there's, we have uh, one of the commandments or the way that being a good Jewish person is expressed in, char in society is that you give to charity, all right? You do acts of kindness. It's very community-based. And the word for charity uh, is, I'll, ha I'll say it in a botched Hebrew way because it's related to another word. It's tzedakah, all tzedakah. right? Ch charity. That happens to be the same word as justice, mm -hmm. all right? Except one letter, it's one letter more. Tzedek is justice. So one of the Jewish things that was really so helpful to me is that Justice and, and love and kindness are the same thing. When you seek justice or you express to someone how outraged you are at their injustice, you are actually doing an act of kindness. Mm. So that was helpful to me because I have like lots of uh, obviously Jewish friends, but I also have a number of Christian friends. Mm -hmm. And to, just to generalize, but when people would come and visit, uh, for the most the Christian friends would say, God loves you. And that might be true, but it, it didn't, it just seemed a pointless thing to say, but the Jewish people would walk in and the first thing they say is, may God avenge her blood, Christine's blood. Mm -hmm. And let God do it, we don't mm -hmm. take vengeance, but this anger at the injustice of it all was the most loving comment people uh, could have given me. Yeah, but it, it seems like the opposite 
love and vengeance, but you say it's justice, actually connected together. Justice, love and together. justice. Love and yeah. justice. Justice is, look, it's very simple, even in the, I don't remember which book it is, Malachi maybe, where God tells him, he says, all I want is three things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry anything about life and God's will. I just need you to do three things. Love mercy, do justice, and keep yourself humble. Mm -hmm. And justice is always part of love in, in Jewish thought. Right. And it can be also in the West because it's, uh, if you take like, um, I don't know, let's just say there's a situation of child abuse, right? You, the kid doesn't just need to hear that God loves him. He wants his dad or whatever or somebody big to say, you know what, I'm going to go and punch out their lights. I'm going to mm. do justice for you. I'm going to make sure that person sits in prison. How and is, the kid knows yeah. he's loved. How did that help you specifically in your situation? Because I felt so, um, well, I was I, in the forest too. Uh, and I've done a lot of thinking over 12 years. I realized that the most enraging part of all of this is the sheer helplessness of everything. To be helpless, it's not just terrifying. It's like, it's like when a baby is born, you know, when a baby gets born, why is he crying? Mm -hmm. Not because the doctor slapped him, because he's helpless. Mm -hmm. And this helplessness is like a meltdown. So when you feel so help, when I feel so helpless, felt so helpless in the forest and the subsequent years where I needed everybody to help me, it was also rage inducing, but then for somebody to come and say, listen, I've got this, I'm going to do justice for you. I'm going to make sure that these Palestinian terrorists will never get out of jail. I'm going to fight for this. I'm, and you're helpless. And it's just like ointment on your wounds. Mm. So uh, I think it's the same for anybody who's been violated. Mm -hmm. We need to validate someone else's pain. Right. And what, what other uh, wisdom did you find in the Jewish way of thinking? Um, okay, I found a lot from how the culture lives itself out. First of all, we have a saying in Hebrew, klal uh, prat, the collective and the individual. Yes, we are all individuals, but in Jewish life and Jewish thinking, uh, even in, look, we just did Yom Kippur, right? Mm -hmm. So we stand in synagogue for Yom Kippur, we say prayers for hours, and it's not uh, forgive me because I have, it's all in the plural. We have accused, we have betrayed, we, 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 we. It's also what is written in the book of Daniel, eh? when he's repenting before yes. God. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. it's always, your, I, I realized more, it was enhanced, it's not that I didn't know it before, but I'm part of a people. Uh, not to be too frivolous, but if I'm going to be stabbed for being a Jew, I might as well be one. And mm -hmm. so what does that part of a people mean? It means that my incident, what a terrible word, my attempted murder is one attempt of millions of Jews mm -hmm. who've been murdered in the last 2,000 years. Mm. So helping see myself as part of the collective. It makes you less alone? It, yeah, it gives you kind of, it's a weird shaping of identity. But it's not just it made me feel less alone. It, it uh, decreased this self-importance that we have because when something bad happens to us all, any of us, the most natural question we have is like, why me, right? Why me? Why me? And there's a little Jewish joke when, you, when the Jew says to God, why me? And God says, why not? Mm. Meaning, like we've had some terrible incidences the last, uh, even the Ukraine, I know how, how much you guys are involved in the mm. Ukraine and bombing innocent civilians, and we're, all, we're it's terrible. But I, when I read this stuff or see it, I can say it's terrible, but I never say, why them? Mm. I only say it when it happens to me. And that is entitlement. Like, somehow in the back of my mind, I expected that God would be there to, like, get me out of trouble protect and protect you. me. Why? Why? He doesn't do it for other people. So it made me realize that I'm not, I, it was a late, what do you call it? spring 
I realized that I wasn't the center of the world. Mm. And there's something very liberating about that, that it's not actually all about me, mm -hmm. that we never promise that nothing, anything bad will happen to us. But this is good knowledge, but the emotions, I can oh, the imagine, emotion. yeah, it's are different because you, you are daily in pain and you have the trauma and you have to yeah. cope with it. So I can imagine the why question comes back quite often in your head, or doesn't no. it? No, uh, no, actually, no, it doesn't. Uh, but thank you for recognizing that. Mm. The question that I had to ask myself uh, wasn't why me, or it wasn't even where, like, where was God, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know where God was, but I heard the birds singing. I mean, it's like I never blame God for a beautiful sunrise, so I'm not quite sure why I should accuse him for murder. Mm -hmm. It's like God is almost a non sequitur. People did this, not, not God. Mm -hmm. But I found the right question to ask is how? Meaning, uh, if you take these terrorists who are 34, 35 years old, how could they, I'm sure when they were two years old, they were kicking a ball around the street and giggling, how could they grow up and become the cold-blooded savages that they are? What led them to that? Mm. And that's actually what started me off on this uh, uh, discovering, I don't know where I was for all those years, discovering that they receive a monthly salary and the incitement and the anti-Semitism in the Palestinian Authority. You know, you, you, you feed on that, you're going to turn out to mm. be a, the people they became to be. Yeah, we're going to talk about yeah. that just a little later, but uh, about the Jewish... Uh, yeah. um, way of thinking is there other yeah i would say uh, there's something else it's like yeah. uh and, and uh oh so we were talking about job before i mm -hmm. interrupted myself it's uh so the the jewish culture is that let's say someone dies right we sit shiva we sit seven days of mourning yeah. of mourning and in those seven days it's customary you walk in you bring food you take care of the person who's uh, bereaved and the only thing you say is, I'm sorry for your loss, because that's all there is to say. And then as the week goes on, the person feels a bit more comforted and uh, they get the photos out, this kind of stuff. So one of the things that I've learned more is that when something terrible happens to someone, or we hear they've got cancer, or uh, I don't think this is prevalent in Israel, but it is in the West. People don't know how to deal with it. Like, do we say something? Are they going to be upset? Mm -hmm. And I would sign on the dotted line every time, say something. Don't give advice. It's not for us to advise. But you know what we say to people who are in incredible distress? We go up to them and we just say, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. That is an incredibly powerful and healing sentence. Why is this healing? Healing, because nobody is advising you. There's nothing worse than the advisory committee or people saying, and I don't blame anyone because mm -hmm. I've said some dumb things in my life, uh, but I learned through hard experience what not to say. Uh, the, the advice, we feel so helpless. We want to advise, right? And sometimes, it's just better to be quiet. Mm -hmm. So when you don't say anything to somebody who's suffering, it, you are validating their pain. And you're not saying, oh, I know how you feel, mm -hmm. right? Because none of us know anything about how someone else feels. No. Even if, let's say, heaven forbid, there was going to be someone who got into a terror attack and they were stabbed 13 times and there was friend would say, I wouldn't know how they feel. I'm not them. I don't come from their background. I don't have their makeup. It's... We delude ourselves into thinking mm -hmm. that because we've had a similar experience or some experience of suffering, then we know how someone feels. But that's not true. We don't. No. We don't. It's, let's, take, look, let's take a simpler example. Divorce. One couple gets divorced, another couple gets divorced. And they say, oh, I know how you feel. No, you don't. You weren't in that relationship. So to avoid this I know how you feel even though it comes from good intent and to avoid giving the advice you're just with the person in their pain mm. that speaks louder than any kind of word. Is that also a really a Jewish way to deal with pain and with trauma you think? Um, yeah I think everything has a place and a time yeah you know I do it listen Israel Israel is a tough society you've been there so many times and it's kind of hard to outdo the suffering mm -hmm. Yeah, I really have. I was very well known. 
and you get to the point where people feel they can like have a lighter, jokier conversation. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, I was stabbed 13 times and somebody in all seriousness would have been stabbed 14 or it's like, you can't have this terror victim Olympics. You so, mean to compete with suffering? No, there's no need. No, no that's a ridiculous thing. Like mm -hmm. also people say, it's nothing like you went through, but, and I think to myself, I'm so glad it's nothing like I went through. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make suffering comparable. It doesn't mean to say that what I, I went through is necessarily worse mm -hmm. because it depends on the individual makeup of that person. And how you deal with it, probably. Completely. Yeah. So we have to get this comp competition out of the way. So you're saying that uh, if the people who are watching this uh, live stream at home and they are thinking, okay, what should I do when I visit somebody who has gone through a loss or who had a trauma? How can I help the best way? You told me some advice as how not to do it. How not to do it. Maybe we can go. Okay, to the okay so another one. Don't ask what somebody needs. Okay. It, it, when it's an immediate trauma, people don't know their name, right? They don't know what they need. I don't know what the Dutch do. I found mm -hmm. the Dutch people very kind and generous. Get food, bring food, right? Life goes on, you have to eat. Bring a hot meal, but be generous with it, all right? Mm. Don't be Dutch. Be <laughs> generous. Bring food Big to that meals. person. Yeah. yeah. Make sure, or if people are visiting someone, make out a little uh, Excel chart of who's mm. going to be on duty for what, all right? Walk in, just put the food in the fridge, put it in the oven, take the initiative. Mm -hmm. And they just say, I'm so sorry, I have no idea how you feel. No. I have no words. I'm so sorry. Here's the falafel. Yeah. That's it's very helps. powerful, yeah. or the syrup waffle, whatever you call it. Yeah. So you mentioned it already very briefly, the book of Job yeah. uh, in, in the Bible. And Job is a person in the Bible who suffered uh, also very much. It's difficult to compare, of course, but the book is about his suffering and mm. how he dealt with it, how his friends reacted to it, and how God responded in the end. What did you learn from this I, I book? learned from Job. I have to preempt this with how Jewish people look at the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. It's because uh, it might sound a little bit sacrilegious to some viewers, and I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. But we're very critical of the people in the Bible because we see ourselves in them, all right? It's not like they can't be touched or criticized or just dismissed. They're human beings. So I was, after what happened to me happened to me, I got to say, I wasn't a fan of Job. I, I thought he was like just being a drama queen. I mean, he got some boils, he lost his job. And I'm thinking, you weren't stabbed 13 times. Mm. Even the 10 of his children died, but God gives him back 10 children, like, like they're pairs of shoes. Mm. I don't, and the whole book, I don't understand. I don't understand how God, uh, and I'm not talking theology. I don't understand that there was this divine competition between God and the Satan. Mm -hmm. And poor Job was stuck in the middle of it. So there's a lot I don't understand. With that, the end of the book is amazing because you would think that somebody who had suffered so much like Job, you would think in that place when that suffered person, suffering person comes to God and they mm. say, hey God, you know, I'm suffering so much. You would think God would be my son, I love you. You're precious to me. Mm. But the Hebrew is much more uh, expressive and it's it literally gives you this feeling that God is rolling up his sleeves mm -hmm. flexing his muscles that's the reaction to the to the suffering and to the suffering and he looks at Job and he, if you've been in Israel he goes like what who are you like where were you when I was making the mountains almost like how dare you question me but it wasn't like a mean response it was like be like this little boy looking at this great Ajax soccer player, right? And they say, oh, my favorite soccer player has got this in control. So it was, it was this bigness, this greatness of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost the kind of impatience from God towards Job, which was the very thing that Job mm -hmm. needed to hear. Have you experienced that in your life that you feel there is somebody in control? No, I haven't, no. Uh, I, w I wish I had. I had a very disappointing near-death experience, mm -hmm. meaning I know other people who have near-death experience and they see a bright light, they feel God or whatever, their life. 
flash before them. I had nothing like that. Mm-hmm. And that's terrified me because it's like, wow, what does that mean when we... And it doesn't mean anything. It simply means I didn't have that same experience as somebody else. Right. And trauma could be very much play a part in that. However, the fact that I didn't have a near-death experience, that means, I mean, I, I have no doubt when I go out and watch the birds or hike in the desert, I have no doubt whatsoever that God is a merciful, kind and good, mm-hmm. good, good God. So I think my faith is pretty impressive, mm-hmm. considering I have no evidence like these other people do mm-hmm. when they die. But I haven't experienced it that where I feel God is in control. Mm. That would be, uh, no. And I'm, I'm also reluctant to tie any kind of, oh, it's a miracle you're still alive. It might be a medical miracle, I don't know. I'm thankful for being alive. But I would not want to attribute theological importance to the fact that I survived. Because somebody died, yeah. right? So it's just like, all I can do is say, Thank you, God, that I have another day to live. That's Mm. amazing you gave me the gift of another day. Right. Has your viewpoint on death changed since the attack? Uh, I don't know if it's it's the the experience of death or if it's because I'm just getting older. Um, You tell me. I think it's probably both, but, but, but it's given me a heightened awareness of life. How how lucky we are to be alive. We're all so lucky to be alive. And how, what a gift life is. And it's made me focus on, not to, not to look, how can I say? We, we have to, not to come to terms with the past, but to recognize that, that what happened was cosmic. It was beyond any mm-hmm. description, but it's in the past. I can't change that, right? And when I look to the future, I can't control the future because I don't even know we're going to finish this studio interview. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. That's what we all have in common. So it's kind of made me hold the past more lightly Mm -hmm. and not really worry too much about the future, but focus on the present. Mm -hmm. And the present, that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. I I obviously have a tend. I don't really worry about the future at all. Uh, it's almost like after you go through such a big trauma, you become deluded that you're invincible. I t- oh, I thought about this this morning. It's like, I thought it was smart, something smart. You know what this does? It like it puts a ceiling and a floor. Yeah. Meaning, I feel that the terror attack is a floor mm-hmm. in the sense that it doesn't matter what is going to come next. It can never, ever be as bad as that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure of that, but I say that 99% sure. And the ceiling would be, even though I've got some joy back and I can have a laugh, we've laughed a lot together and I can enjoy great things, there's always that edge that Mm -hmm. it will never be that carefree uh, experience that it was before the attack. Because it's limited. Yeah, it's a reminder, you know, it's not caged in but Mm. it's a framework it reframes your thinking right so um we talked about the bible about the ways of jewish thinking and you also explained i've got one more thing oh really yeah yeah so the other thing would be and you know this from being in israel so you go you ask a regular israeli hey manishma how are you and you know we have many issues in israel (laughs) So it would be like, oh, the Palestinians are bombing from Gaza, the price of the rent's gone up, I got a parking ticket, my son's in the army, and they give you all the lists, because we love to complain, and then at the end it will say, the person will say, Baruch Hashem, blessed be his name. What does this mean? This is Hebrew thinking, and it's block logic. It means one set of circumstances doesn't have to interpret the other, all right, or uh, you know what I mean? You have to hold mm-hmm. these things in tension. So even though things can be terrible, you still go on by praising God. Yes, but we never praise God for evil. Mm-hmm. I'm ne- I will never thank God for evil because God doesn't do evil, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but I can uh, recognize that life is difficult, but there are good things to bless him for. Listen, in, in one day we have a hundred blessings. Mm-hmm. 
the beauty of Judaism, all right, because we are creatures of habit, whether we like it or not, is that if we learn a ritual or a liturgy, which some people will say, oh, that's not for me. But there's something amazing that mm. we have these physical reminders of life that we bless God, even, even, even with the water, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you say when you drink the water? I say, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe, uh, who everything was made by his hand. Mm -hmm. All right? And we, uh, or we see a rainbow or we hear the clap of thunder. It's mm -hmm. like there's a blessing for everything. And you also have a blessing on your arm. Huh? I have, actually, this is a prayer. Uh -huh. This is, uh, I don't know if your cameras can see, but it's, it's the prayer every Jewish person says upon waking in the morning. Because in Judaism, they say that sleep, I don't remember the percentage. They say when you're asleep, it's like 0.6% of the experience of death. Mm -hmm. you don't, when you're asleep, you don't know you're asleep, right? And when we're dead, we probably don't know we're dead. So this says, Blessed are you, O... No, it doesn't say blessed are you. I give thanks to you, O living and eternal King, that in your great compassion you've restored my soul. Hmm. I mean, and so why did I get this? I'm talking too much, I'm sorry. That's so good. much to say. <laughs> but I got this. By the way, an Arab tattooed this on me. Got a nice Arab young man. I said, you're going to tattoo me with a Jewish prayer. It was great. We did it at the Israel Museum. So why did I get this? Because I, as I said, I'm a very poor sleeper. And I sleep in like this. And it's so easy to focus on the bad, right? The negative, the constant niggly pain, the psychological horror. And then I understood, and it's, it's biblical too, I think, certainly Jewish, there's two things you can do with coping with bad things. Mm -hmm. One is humor. And I, I, I'm very big on humor. Never laugh at what happened to someone else, but we can laugh at ourselves because then we've won. And the other is to cultivate a grateful heart. And it's really hard work. Cultivate, that's a fantastic word. You know, you have to plant the seeds. You have to make sure every day it gets the right sunshine and the right amount of water. So when I see this prayer of thanking God, mm -hmm. I then literally do like Netflix in my mind, where I go back to the beginning of the day, like, thank you, I woke up. Thank you that my dog jumped on me and licked my nose. Thank you that the sun is shining. Thank, and you make this list in your head and then you realize there's so much to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning, I haven't learned it all, that uh, if we do that, we learn to see ourselves as one of the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And we're just all filthy rich and we don't realize it. Yeah. And one thing the terrorists cannot have is our mind and our soul. Right. Because of what happened to you 12 years ago, are you afraid of Palestinians because the terrorists were Palestinians? Um, no, but I think as a responsible Israeli citizen, I'm vigilant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's just normative behavior in Israel. I don't... Um, what do you mean by that? Be careful because you be never careful. know what's going to happen. Yeah, like uh, you've been to the airport many times, you have security going all around. I've seen people on the beach, mm -hmm. they leave their towels and their bag and they go for a swim and then suddenly their underwear is blown up. You know, it's like um, we're very, very vigilant. Am I afraid of Palestinians? So not in the big sense, but um, I would not want to get in an elevator with Palestinian men and they are probably the nicest men in the world, mm -hmm. but I'm not there. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be in an enclosed space with, with men. Palestinian men. Yeah. I really don't. And that's nothing against them. No. In fact, I'll tell you a story. When I was doing trauma therapy at Hadassah Hospital. In Jerusalem. Yes. I had this, uh, you know, I was very seriously injured. Punctured lung, bones in my lungs, 30 broken bones. I mean, it can go on and on and on. And trauma therapy was on floor number seven. And one day, I mean, I'm in a wheelchair to make it easier. 
and my friend pushes me in the elevator and then I see we're in an elevator with two Arab men. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I said, let's get out. And in those, with those injuries, I walked seven flight of stairs. Now, what's the deal with this? The men in the elevator who were Arabs were wearing white coats and they were doctors. Mm -hmm. So there's no, and it was an Arab doctor who saved my life. Yeah. So yes, I'm afraid, but I'm also rational about it all. Yeah. We talked previously about Palestinian Authority and how they are funding uh, terrorism. Can you explain what is happening there? So the Palestinian Authority is the formally recognized leadership of the Palestinians mm -hmm. uh, who don't have a state and they've never had a state, they've never had a commonwealth, nothing, all right? Mm -hmm. But they are formally recognized as the leadership of the Palestinians. And what happens is they're the biggest recipients of foreign aid in the world. Mm -hmm. Over the years, they've received $71 billion. And you who've been in all parts of Israel, Judea and Samaria, you will see, like, despite this huge funding, mm -hmm. you don't have any decent hospitals, you don't have heating in schools, you don't have clinics, it's like libraries. Mm. Where has the money gone? So where is the money gone? So the money goes... And there are Palestinians who say they have to be very careful. I think you interview one young guy, but follow the money. A lot of it, billions they pocket for themselves. Mm. And the other thing is they have a system where they are on the payroll. People can be on the payroll of the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. and they're paid, depending on how many Jews they murder, they're paid per Jew while they're in prison. So they have salaries in prison that comes actually from foreign aid. Mm. Now, I'd spent the last six years speaking about this. Mm -hmm. Because the terrorists who tried to kill you and killed Christine, they get a salary? Yeah, yeah. And Christine's murderers, I mean, we mustn't forget that Christine, and I don't know why the West is so dumb and blind about this. Christine, a Christian, we, in that documentary, later on, you have the confession by the murderers. The, the police say, well, why did you choose this place? And they say, oh, we wanted to murder Jews. And it doesn't matter whether she was Jewish or not, but Christine wasn't Jewish, but she was mm -hmm. slaughtered because they assumed she was Jewish. So they, uh, they get these salaries. I don't know how, many, how much money exactly mm -hmm. uh, the terrorists who attacked us get, but I think it's uh, over a million at the moment. Yeah. which is a lot of money. Now, your government, the political parties, Holland pretty much led the way and stopped mm -hmm. that funding. funding. Yeah, and then yes, it was yeah. a little bit of a, what mm -hmm. do you call it, snowball effect with other European countries. Yeah. But uh, another thing, by the way, like it all, I, it doesn't matter about personality, but one thing that President Trump got right was he knew that you had to stop funding terrorism. Mm -hmm. And he, that was one of the first things he did. He stopped the funding of the Palestinian Authority. And interestingly, one of the first things that President Biden has done is renewed the funding. Yeah. And you cannot get to any kind of peace if you're going to be participant in fu funding cold-blooded murderers. Right. Is there a specific message that you want to give to the people who are watching this video? What is it the most important thing uh, that you want them to remember from this video? Well, f first of all, I want them to remember that I personally thank Christians for Israel mm. for all the amazing work that you guys do for my people, and especially stopping the funding. It's ama just, I'm so impressed with this. So I think every single person who watches the TV mm. and sees your show and does what they can, I want them to remember that there is an Israeli sitting here who's very grateful. Mm. The, the other thing would be, that if I've learned anything, all right, if it's young people watching this, going to university, it's like, yes, it is important what you do and how you choose your profession, but it's not the most important thing. It's not really what you do that matters. It's who you are in mm. what, what you do, okay? You can be a waiter, and that's fantastic. If you are a kind waiter, you can make someone's life different, all right? They can be having a terrible day and they'll think back to that waiter. You can be the worst, horriblest doctor in the world, right? Who's so mean that you... So it's not what you do, but it's who you are and what you do. The other thing I would say is that, and we spoke about it, 
we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So live life to the full. Don't mm -hmm. have a contempt for life, hoping that one day we're all going to get to heaven. We don't know these things. Please, God, I don't know. But, but call someone just to hear their voice. If mm -hmm. you love someone, tell them why you love them. Hug. Be generous. Offer to, because it's in relationship that we, we come alive. And, and also, if we hurt people's feelings, keep short accounts. Say you're sorry. Mm. Really, always say you're sorry if you hurt somebody. Live by the moment, you say. Mm. Yeah, live by the moment. But do soul check. You know, you're mm. cleaning house all the time. How am I before the master of the universe? How am I in, in front of my family and my community? Tell, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.